And then that brings us to today, seemingly a totally different issue, but it all comes together because we don't trust our government. So when our government comes out and tells us there's this conflict over between Russia and Ukraine and we have to get involved and we don't trust them. I, I don't want to send my, my, my guys, like boys and girls over here to war for any reason, really, but definitely not one that you give me. But at the same time, it's like, I don't like the idea of one country going into another country and seemingly violating their sovereignty, their borders. I don't like the idea of Russia gaining a geopolitical advantage in the region. But I understand that Russia or a China is looking over at the disarray in the U.S. and the lack of trust in the United States government saying, yeah, this is the time. So as I, as I posted earlier on my Instagram, I'm really not sure what to believe, who to trust. But I do know one thing. I stand with the people. I don't, whatever country they are, the, the people, the regular working people who are just trying to support their family, those are the people who I stand with. And what I feel most comfortable doing with at this time I am going to give a little bit more of my opinion at the end, but I think that we really do need to reserve our opinion because what happens when everybody wants to be the first to talk about it, the first to give their opinion, a misinformation gets spread because everybody wants to share something before they independently corroborate the facts, but B it gets used for these culture wars, the political wars, and it gets squarely against us The people, when we come out and we want to be like rah, rah for this political party or rah, rah for that political party or beating the war drum, right? Even if we have like this patriotic inclination to do so. So a couple of sources that I found useful for sorting through a lot of issues, but this issue in particular is first and foremost, Russell Brand. Um, He's been really great over these past couple of years, at least since I've tapped into him to sorting through these complicated issues. Um, sometimes he can, I find him a little bit annoying here and there, but for the most part, he's very thoughtful. He seems very honest and he's been doing really good coverage. So this one came out, I believe this morning or late last night, because a lot of people, the people who are falling, didn't really think that this was actually going to go through. They didn't actually think Russia was going to go full scale invasion. And so they're like, oh, OK, I got to rethink my analysis. So he really does a good job in this video breaking it down. So I recommend this one. And it, it, he could have put something else out since then, but I don't think so. And then the other person who I'm consistently relying on for domestic also, she's been great on the coronavirus and the lockdowns and the mandates here in the U S but her specialty is really foreign policy. Kim Iverson. She is amazing on foreign policy. Her take is going to be way different than whatever else you're hearing on the mainstream. Um, she really has an ability to get that good knowledge of what is, what are the local relationships between people? What's the local culture? Versus what's the American perception of what that is based on basically our own reality. So she has her own channel, Kim Iverson. You can look her up or she is also featured on Rising, which is, um, what is it? The Hills show. So if you go to The Hill Rising, um, Kim is one of their hosts and she is really great. She's one of these classical um, liberals who typically ended up in the progressive camp. So she was like a Bernie person. Um, She was also a big Tulsi supporter, just like me, um, but has really seen the left kind of leave her behind. And now she's often associated more with like the center, center right. But I I feel like that's a lot of my friends who identified as Democrats, like these progressive Democrat types, Bernie supporters. Um, they feel themselves left behind and they're really, you know, finding the classical liberal in themselves. Um, and I've always said, like, I've always felt like I've had so much in common with these, with, with my friends who are like that, but certain labels, I felt like 
made us feel like we are further apart than we were. So in some ways, a lot of this has really bring brought me closer to people who ideologically, I think, felt really far away from me before the pandemic. And now we're like, oh, actually, like our politics are pretty similar here, you know? Um, so in terms of the the Russia Ukraine thing though i've seen a lot of misinformation going around on the internet it looks like people are taking different scenes from movies that americans maybe aren't familiar with and using those or it seems like old old pictures from articles from 2018 or whatever earlier in the 2000s are being used um but some things that I do want to point to, not because I'm saying like, this is the thing and this is definitely it, or this is definitely part of it, but just things to think about, things to consider when we're putting in place the geopolitical context for what's going down in Ukraine. So um, Ukraine is obviously part of the former Soviet Union. And one of the big things going on is this idea that Ukraine was going to join NATO. Now, we were nowhere close to having Ukraine join NATO. There was no resolution on the table or anything like that. It was just an idea that was put out there in what appears to be kind of sloppy diplomacy. And so that was one of the reasons that Putin was openly giving for this his aggression towards Ukraine. But there's other things, too. I saw going around these images of being like, look at all the different um, plants, the biological program plants that U.S. has in Ukraine. But I can't really confirm those specific maps. But what I do feel comfortable sharing is this right here, which is from the United States website, the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine, talking about how they have different programs in Ukraine to deal with biological threats, right? The the most the world's most dangerous infectious diseases could outbreak at you know any moment. So to help accomplish this bio threat reduction mission, we have bio risk management culture, international pa partnerships, and so I'm. It's definitely a high likelihood that there are biological laboratories in Ukraine. Ukraine has a relationship with the United States with those, and that could be adding to the tensions. I can't, that's not something that I've been able to either do enough research into or be able to find to confirm that. But again, just putting some facts out on the table about the relationship between the U.S. and Ukraine and Russia. Um, so another thing that I found interesting was... And I, I knew this because I was aware of it as it was happening. The president of Ukraine is actually an actor comedian. And he's famous for a TV show in which he was the president of Ukraine. So he played the president of Ukraine on the TV show. And then the people elected him as the actual president. Um, but my guy over here, Dream Rare has a, a nice little quick video that breaks it down. So I thought that we would give this a quick watch. Crazy story. The current president of Ukraine is actually an actor producer who created a television show for himself to star in where he starred as the president of Ukraine. And then years later ran for president and won. This show started a year after the revolution in Ukraine of 2014. And here's the story. Prior to his acting career, Zelensky obtained a degree in law at the Kiev National Economic University. He then pursued comedy and created the production company Kvartal 95, which produces films, cartoons, and TV shows, including Servant of the People, in which Zelensky played the role of the president of Ukraine. The series aired from 2015 to 2019 and was immensely popular. A political party bearing the same name as the television show was created in March 2018 by employees of Kvartel 95, which, remember, is his production company. He then announced his candidacy in 2019, a political outsider. He'd already become one of the front runners in opinion polls for the election. He won the election with 73.2% of the vote, identifying as a populist, positioned himself as an anti-establishment, anti-corruption figure. Share this in your story if you think it's interesting. Right. So I obviously thought this was interesting. So I shared it with you guys. You know, again, I don't want to make too many 
assumptions based off of this, but one of the things that I think really stuck out that probably most Americans don't know off the top of the hand of their head is Ukraine had a revolution in 2014. Now, I think that's definitely something that we need to look more into, right? Did the U.S. have any role in this revolution as the United States has had roles in causing revolution in other countries in the past? I don't know. Perhaps I know that there's a lot of connections between the United States and Ukraine because of their position in the oil market, right? We all know about Burisma and how Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son, had a position on one of the boards in Ukraine. I know that there was something about the election and some of the servers possibly ending up in Ukraine. And there was that whole phone call between Trump and the president of Ukraine. So there's definitely been a lot around there that we need to go back and really maybe take a second look at from another perspective, knowing where this all leads to and seeing if we can go back further and connect some dots. But again, just interesting things to think about when we're doing this. But my real problem with Ukraine, again, is that I don't trust our government. I don't trust what is coming out of my TV. I don't trust what our intentions are going into this conflict. I don't trust that we simply want to ensure the sovereignty and the borders of the Ukrainian people. It's just, it's never been the case in my lifetime. And looking back even to earlier wars, there's manufactured consent. There are false flags. And then meanwhile, we want to sit here and stand up for democracy and the rights of people in other countries. And yet what is unfolding across our own country? What is unfolding in the border of the country to the north of us? Uh, It's just. That's that's we have no credibility as a country, which is unfortunate because I don't want to see these other powers gain You know, I don't want to see a Russia or a China or, you know, a lot of these countries in the Middle East necessarily gain, you know, supremacy over these regions in a way that, you know, China's not a good person to have power, right? And nor is Russia. But again, who are the United States to talk at this point? We're all doing the same thing. We're, you know, we just picture ourselves as the good guy. And then there's the whole thing with the World Economic Forum. That's another angle that Kim Iverson has been covering really well. All of these people, whether they're United States, whether they're Canadian, right, whether they're um, Trudeau or Putin or Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, they're all World Economic Forum young, young leaders. And who's leading this kind of push for the pandemic and the new reset? the World Economic Forum. So this opens up a whole nother basket of potential reasons for this going. Perhaps that this whole thing is just to cause more chaos. It's just a cover for some type of cyber attack, which I know a lot of people have been predicting is like the next pandemic is a cyber attack. Thanks for checking out this video. Make sure you've smashed that like button and leave me a comment down below. And while you're down there, Make sure you're subscribed to the channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my videos, which you can watch more of by clicking here or here. Or for even more, go to teachingliberty.org and join our community today.